Daniela, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure the topic is much easier than the yesterday ones. Um, yes, uh, we are supposed to focus on how to bridge the cultures and uh, what is the role in, of heritage in it. So I will try to end with this, but uh, seeing the title of the panel, it's still the culture in the times of crisis, war, of course, how it can contribute. So I will focus on cultural policy, um, actually. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to offer uh, some theoretical concepts very uh, shortly on cultural diplomacy and cultural policy. I don't know if we have students uh, focusing on culture here, um, at least some of them you mentioned, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then uh, I will try to offer some uh, cultural war analysis between uh, Ukraine and Russia, since the uh, title was uh, The Times of Crisis and War, and how cultural policy models relate to them. So uh, I did the analysis from a twofold perspective, um, Ukraine and Russia towards others, and the other one, Ukraine-Russia, so how um, they interact in the war. And then I will put it in the context of a political thought. I'm not a political scientist, but I'm sure like maybe Jody and uh, Sanya can contribute to it also, and uh, offer you some um, scenarios for possible bridging of cultures. Uh, so um, starting from theory, in the theory uh, there is a difference between cultural diplomacy and international cultural relations, but normally the function of cultural diplomacy in international relations uh, would be also twofold, uh, having a unilateral uh, aspect of building a national image, and this is what we talk about when we say soft power and Joseph Nye, which you, who you mentioned, and multilateral aspect of encouraging international cultural cooperation and strengthening peace and solidarity, which is actually also in an EU foreign uh, policy. So um, Milton Cummings uh, said that cultural diplomacy actually entails exchange of ideas, informa information, values, systems, traditions, beliefs, and other aspects of culture with the aim of promoting mutual understanding. So this is when uh, Aniko, when introduced, thought probably, yes, this is the easier topic, but you will see how culture can also become um, a means for uh, fighting war. Uh, Simon Anholt, who is um, uh, an expert in branding, actually, uh, said that cultural diplomacy entails national values, traditions, natural and cultural peculiarities and ways of life, which are the comparative advantage of individual countries and the new source of power. He um, was referring to branding, so this is how you can use culture for branding, right? Um, of course, the cultural uh, achievements of a particular nation have a powerful influence on the perceptions and decisions of consumers, or maybe if you don't like to call them consumers, but uh, just citizens, how they actually see what a certain culture or certain country is about. So culture actually has tools for it, and these can be found either in theater, in cinema, uh, so you can use films, music, arts, literature uh, for achieving uh, these goals. So the difference between cultural diplomacy and international cultural relations would be in uh, the fact that international cultural relations uh, entail, uh, a bro it's a broader uh, term. It refers to the promotion of understanding between countries and of course, there are peoples too. Whereas cultural diplomacy in its original sense refers to the projection of cultural uh, values and the achievements of a particular country. Uh, and they use diplomats uh, who we have also here. And I suppose my colleague Klaus is going to talk about it in more details. So there is the interweaving of uh, these uh, concepts. 
So let's go to the topic. So uh, how we analyze uh, the cultural war between uh, um, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, generally, the term cultural policy uh, entails a conscious regulation of interests. There were, these are the state interests in the field of culture and how they make decisions on all issues related to the cultural development of a social community. So usually there are, so each country should have its own cultural policy model. Uh, I'm not saying that there are like five models and everybody fits into these models, but um, through, throughout history, we could have seen that there are uh, different models and most countries um, can be put into some of these cat categories. Um, so when a certain cultural policy model is performed, it is uh, often in line with political ideology. So generally speaking, I'm not saying that this is like 100%, but generally speaking, when a country is focusing on cultural heritage, it's mostly performing some conservative uh, ideology, whereas cultural industries, for example, would be mostly with liberal economy. With uh, alternative cultures, it would be possibly like social democrats uh, in the European sense and stuff like that. But so this is the idea. So I'm going to present here only two models, which I find uh, very closely related to Ukraine and Russia, or what's going on here. Uh, the textbook example of the Russian uh, model, cultural policy model, was the so-called engineer state model. This is the title, actually, of my uh, presentation. So uh, the engineer state model is usually associated with totalitarian regimes. I'm not saying it's only Russia, but even some Western countries have it, like the social democrat systems of the Western world. But so the goal of this type of a model would be to control the whole sector of culture by owning all the means of the artistic production, how it relates to practice, um, there have been artists who always uh, produced uh, art uh, in terms with, uh, in uh, aligned to the political ideology. So, if it was in back in Yugoslavia, it was the President Tito, and then all the artists would make the monuments of the President Tito and stuff like that. Uh, so, creative and innovative the dimension of culture in this model is not really supported. It's rather compromised. Uh, the other model, national emancipatory model, is um, characterized, it's usually found in colonies, in colonial countries, where one uh, culture is dominating and the other one is always oppressed. So once you get rid of the uh, colonizer, uh, then you try to uh, instill your own culture, which was forgotten. So that was the case of uh, Mongolia, for example, or Moldova in uh, uh, Europe. So, um, of course, it's reasonable that if your own culture was oppressed throughout times, then you would like to uh, put it uh, on the pedestal now, but what usually happens in this uh, uh, type of uh, cultural policy model, that minority cultures are then neglected hmm? because the dominant culture comes uh, in front. Um, the question, can cultural diplomacy actually bridge the two cultures during the war? And my thesis is very hardly. So during the war, cultural diplomacy has no greater um, strength. So uh, soft power versus hard power is very difficult to, uh, to fight it. Um, so as I said, culture is also a very political. It often instills on political ideology. So it can also become a means of fighting. In the case of Ukraine-Russia uh, war, uh, on one hand we have uh, um, the diplomacy Ukraine towards others and Russia towards others and the uh, perception they send, the picture they send. 
So Ukrainian goal is to increase uh, its own visibility in the world and integrate it into the international cultural context. How did they do it? By communicating Ukrainian cultural identity, which was probably not so visible so far. Whereas the Russian goal is to communicate the inexistence of the Ukrainian ethnicity and culture. So they are actually trying to cancel it, in a way, to put it in the modern uh, language, right? Uh, in between, uh, when we talk about the possibility of bridging Ukraine and vice versa, ideally the goal would be to bridge, bridge the two cultures for peace. How I'm saying my thesis is very hardly, but ideally by promoting intercultural dialogue. So how Ukraine actually does it, uh, they have uh, the public diplomacy strategy and cultural diplomacy is, is one of the main areas of action, interestingly. The purpose is, as I, you can see here, uh, improve the recognition of Ukraine and its cultural diversity and to form a positive attitude of citizens of other countries towards Ukraine with the goal of achieving a better understanding and thrust. Maybe we didn't know so much about Ukrainian culture, now everybody knows about a Ukrainian culture. So I'm not going to read all of this because uh, this is not the goal, but just to see how they do it through different uh, cultural sectors, is it cinema, popular music, and so on. And um, uh, what's interesting here is they, they also promote projects in the field of cultural art of the indigenous peoples and national minorities. So going back to the national emancipatory model, they didn't forget them. So it's not that just Ukrainian culture is put in front now. Uh, so one of the projects which might uh, be interesting in this context is the postcards from Ukraine. So what they try to do is to um, promote like the before and after, before the damage uh, has been done uh, due to the war and after. So the focus is on destruction. So you can see how they use culture actually to communicate um, the war goals, right? And um, um, how the damage has been done. So the, the idea is to communicate how the damage has been done by Russia. Um, the other project is popularizing the Ukrainian language. It was a project uh, um, originally promoted by the First Lady of Ukraine. So um, the first, I think that the, the first display of this type of the exhibition was in Albertina in uh, Vienna. Yeah. So what they do, they promote uh, Ukrainian language audio gui guides. They, they offer that to tourists so that uh, whatever uh, the language uh, uh, there is, you can actually hear that there is some difference of the language and they speak about Ukrainian culture. Um, Ukraine towards Russia and vice versa. As I said, this uh, bridging of cultures in my view is hardly achievable. And I'm quoting actually Boris Groys, who's a professor of Russian and Slavic studies at the New York University, who said that in the warring countries, art is usually heavily influenced by patriotic public settlement, going back to the cultural policy models. But the anti-war art usually emerges only after war. Hmm. Let's see what uh, the official position of the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine uh, uh, is about. So uh, it um, specifically opposes any cultural dialogue with the aggressor. So uh, I don't know if that was done on purpose, but I put it in the red color. You can see that even they used a small capital, it's not the, the capital letter, but a small uh, Russian, Russian, Russian. So, but uh, um, what's interesting is that it's in line with the national emancipatory cultural policy model. Whereas Russia, this is the famous letter by Putin, or actually the article. Um, so it's it's a huge one. I have I don't know if you've seen it, but it's available online. Uh, so he, he promotes that they are one people, descendants of the ancient Rus. They have language similarity, 
and the modern Ukraine is entirely the product of the Soviet era. So um, it's in line with the colonial concept of cultural policy, therefore uh, the engineer one. So what they promote is pan russification uh, whereas cultural policy actually justifies imperial uh, aspirations. Uh, what were the responses to the war in practice? So um, in terms of heritage, going back to the topic of our panel, um, Ukrainians are uh, uh, moving, uh, removing their monuments, uh, Russian, Russian uh, monuments. Uh, this is not something very specific for Russia. Coming from uh, Croatia, we had this all around. We still have it. Like from the previous periods, everything is put in the basement. It's not destroyed, but it's put in the basement. Um, uh, again, uh, Russia does the same canceling Euro Ukrainian uh, culture. They actually denounced it as national, parochial, and fascist. Uh, and uh, what's visible in practice, there is the organized mass looting of Ukrainian art. I personally wouldn't say that this is the official policy. It's just uh, seizing the opportunity to, to uh, steal something, right? However, there are also projects like uh, anti-war graffiti in Russia, which, uh, so net voine, so there are no, war, no to war. Hmm? or street art even against war in Ukraine. But uh, you probably know that people who do it usually end up in prisons, you know. And there is also the new law on media reporting. Uh, professor who is an expert in media might say a little bit more about it. Uh, they are commonly called fake news law, uh, this, this law and uh, all the social media are blocked. So putting it in the context of political thought, I would uh, say that on one hand we have the so-called political realism in international relations, and on the other side we have social constructivism in international relations. The first one uh, refers to the survival of the state. So uh, uh, the interest is to preserve the nation's culture and economy, and as long as the world is divided into nation states in an anarchic setting, which is the one uh, which we are facing now, so the national interest, and interest comes to the fore. Hmm? It, it's the essence of the international politics. Whereas on the other side, what um, another scenario might be in the future is the so-called social constructivism which focuses on the shared identity, what we all have as Europeans or as a global community. So the norms of international society are transmitted to states through international organizations, which actually shape national uh, policies. So it might be a starting point for the discussion. Uh, so I'm giving you a food for thought. So uh, how we actually can bridge cultures uh, after the war, according to my thesis. Uh, I see three possible scenarios which we, we may dis discuss. So the first one, if Russia wins the war, I think it will go in line with the political realism. The second one, if Ukraine wins the war, it will be more in line with social con constructivism and democratic values uh, uh, based on uh, shared identity. And there could be a half solution, which I will leave for discussion, possibly. Um, um, some examples of bridging the culture. So you know the situation of Cyprus, uh, which is divided between Greece and uh, um, Turks. So um, interesting examples of soft uh, culture, like the one uh, related to gastronomy, actually. Whereas the Nikip Sarias, a Cypriot refugee who settled in London, actually uh, started. Um, she organized uh, food events uh, with pop up in pop up restaurants because food is something which unites us, which puts us on the table. And uh, it really worked with the citizens. You know, I'm not saying that the official policy. Uh, was in line with that, but people uh, actually realized how similar they are and that they 
do share some similar identities. So the motto was break bread, build friendships, and enjoy the power of food. Um, we in Croatia, we had the so-called peaceful reintegration. I must witness that it didn't work that well. I mean, there is no war, obviously, so it's okay. But it's especially in the eastern part of Slavonia, near Serbia, right? Um, if you are interested in that, uh, a colleague of mine uh, and myself um, analyzed it in a paper called Cross-Border Cultural Relations of Croatia and Serbia which um, advocate that if money is involved, and the money is involved through the European Union funds now, then everything works well. So it's milk and honey. Hmm? Uh, again, it's not the official. Officially, we are OK, both Serbia and Croatia. But the narrative in our own countries is still very um, tough. What can cultural sector do at the moment, since the title was also focusing on uh, climate crisis, uh, what uh, cultural institutions do? They respond to energy crisis uh, triggered by the war. Uh, so uh, the network of museums, NEMO, actually also um, put forward some guidelines on energy saving measures for museums. So even the Louvre is now uh, trying to um, put the, the light off, turn the light off uh, in the famous pyramid, but practically all the museums are trying to save energy. So these are little steps, that, but this is at least what we can do. It's not going to win the war or the, stop the war, actually. Uh, but still, this is what culture can do. But what I advocate that in the future, culture will have a huge um, uh, role in bridging the cultures, cultures, whatever uh, uh, the scenario is. So maybe we start from cultural towards climate diplomacy also to add to your list. Hmm? Thank you very much. <laughs>